We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. Plug in to the power of scripture. strong in the Lord and mighty in his power. Put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces. of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. which is the Word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert And always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. I saw a video yesterday that so stirred me, so caused me to tremble. I watched this movement in its, its inception and where it found its birthplace. And I watched a pastor who has embraced the, this movement. I watched him stand up after all, uh, after this thing has gone on for several months. And, and he, he's preaching the gospel. And the sad thing is, this man knew the Lord. And you can tell he's got roots of holiness. You can tell that within him there was at one time a, a, a holy cry for God. And it's so sad. I sat there and I just shook inside. 
I said, my covenant God, what happened to this man? And while he's preaching, there's this eerie, hellish laughter going on all around him. He stands up and tries to preach the gospel. And all you can hear is this laughter. It's so loud that it's, that, that it's just, it's the most incredible thing. I, I called somebody last night. I said, I watched this video. And I said, it's, it's like watching somebody prepare something out of a, a nightmare. Standing up and trying to talk about righteousness and trying to talk about holiness. And there's this eerie, hellish laughter going on the whole time. So loud that nobody can understand what he's saying. And I thought, my, my, my God, my God, that's what it's going to be like in heaven, for, in hell, for preachers who die without Christ. Going to stand there in the blackness preaching the gospel for eternity, listening to the eerie hell is laughter all around them, mocking spirits, mocking the word of God. Doesn't scripture itself teach us that God is not the author of confusion? Where is discernment in this generation? Folks, you don't even have to have discernment anymore to see it. The average man unsaved out on the streets of New York working with a jackhammer would turn it off and watch this and know it's out of order. Even nature itself tells you that when a man speaks, you listen. I said, God, how is it possible? How is it possible? And they make a big display of the fact that there are psychologists and doctors and lawyers in the church that have embraced this thing. But I was in, I was in Guyana, South America three years ago. And I want to remind you that psychologists and doctors and lawyers drank poison. Where's the discernment? I said, God, you don't have to have discernment to see this. I would have known this was out of order before I got saved. Where's the discernment? Can you imagine somebody coming into this church, and I'm preaching the way I am now, and all you hear is this eerie laughter. It's not even holy. I was sharing with somebody this morning, you, you go into a restaurant sometimes for a meal, and there's people at a table that have just told a dirty joke. And there's a certain type of laughter that comes up. It's an unholy laughter. You can, you can hear it. And then there's another type of laughter when somebody has perhaps just talked about their, their son or their daughter doing something funny and everybody laughs and, and you don't, you don't, you haven't heard the story, but by the laughter you know that it's, it's a nice little story and people are just laughing. But when I listened to this video, I, I heard this unholy laughter. Like a dirty joke had just been told. It's so ungodly, it's so incredibly foolish, that the only thing you can say is, my God, it's an absolute delusion. It's like a blanket of blindness is falling over all of these people. I asked myself as this man preached, I said, God, what blinded him? Lord, what blinded this man? Was it the love of money? What was it? It, it was so sad watching this man who once loved the Lord. Stand there, making a virtual fool of himself. Look at the book of First Timothy, please, chapter 6. Oh God, was it the love of money? What is it that causes this blindness? First Timothy, chapter 6. Beginning at verse 5, listen to these ominous words. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. That's where it all began. It began with that gospel that said godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness, verse 6, with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment or clothing, let us be there with content. Verse 9 says, But they that will be rich fall into the temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. 
For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from what? From the faith. It's not that they've erred from uh, being a heathen, or they've erred from the halls of government. They have erred from the faith. They have erred from following Christ. The love of money has brought a blindness on them. And they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, verse 11, O men of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight. Lay hold of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. God, was it the love of money? And I looked at him in absolute shock and horror and disbelief. I said, Lord, was it bitterness? What was in, what, what turned this man? You, you, you had to have seen this thing to understand the absolute horror that's in it. Standing, trying to preach the gospel and can't preach it because of the mocking laughter. Was it bitterness? The scripture warns us that we're to look within ourselves and make sure that nobody allows a root of bitterness to grow within them and thereby many be defiled. Was it unforgiveness? Did somebody hurt this man? Did, did he, was he harmed by leadership over him? Did, he, did somebody do something and he, he harbored it within himself and, and refused to forgive them? Because Jesus said, if you will not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Did unforgiveness cut him off from the grace of God? What blinded this man? Was it rebellion? Was it the sin of Saul? Was he just a good idea man? Was he a man who thought his own ways would produce better results than simple obedience to God? That's what Saul was, and that's why it cost him the kingdom. When Samuel came to Saul, Saul said, I have obeyed the commandment of the Lord. He wasn't even aware he had disobeyed God. He wasn't even aware he was cut off. He just had a good idea. God said, kill them all. I'll just save the best and sacrifice them to the Lord. The Lord requires simple obedience of us. He doesn't want good idea people in his house. He wants us to obey his word. He wants us to find his will and walk in his will. There'll be those that hear this message, and they'll tell you that this is just the voice of another critical spirited preacher out in the wilderness, crying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. They will tell you that their gospel will go on in spite of the cry and warning of those voices that are warning the nation about it. And you know the sad thing is that they're absolutely right. Their gospel will go on. It's a gospel of slaughter. It's been sent by God to judge the carnality of a self-seeking, cross-hating, self-exalting ministry and all of their followers. Brother Mike, back on the radio. Arizona, welcome to HardcoreChristianity.com. Jezebel. The church monster. Jezebel spirit. I'm going to explain it today from a biblical perspective and from a psychological perspective. If you've got a Jezebel in your church or in your living, you're living with one in your family, well, are you in some deep trouble? This powerful demon is a monster. Have you ever known anybody that had a Jezebel spirit? This powerful spirit is extremely dangerous. If this evil spirit enters your church, you're going to be in extremely dire straits shortly. The spirit is a male, and it looks for, most of the time, female humans. And this spirit, this Jezebel spirit, usually always looks for an intelligent woman. And they look for women who had poor father figures and women who have been traumatized in childhood. The reason they're looking for women who've been traumatized in childhood is because they have to be let in to the person by another spirit, and it is the spirit of rejection. The rejection spirit is the most prevalent demon I see in my counseling practice, and it comes from um, abuse in childhood. Abuse, childhood pain, major disappointments, abandonment, divorce, things like that. Trauma in a child opens the door to the rejection demon. This Jezebel spirit is a man hater and a man controller. This spirit wants to be in control. And they're, generally speaking, psychologically attracted to men in authority. They're not looking for the janitor or the custodian at the church. They're looking for the male at the church who, is, who has authority and who is in control. 
partial control or complete control, the pastor, the associate pastor, board members, things like that. They like men in authority, and they have a tremendous ability to uh, appear holy and repentant and humble in public, but behind the scenes, they are the opposite. They live unholy lives. They will not repent because they've got this rebellion sensation through their, in their spirit, and they are not humble. They're controllers, manipulators. And how they manipulate is very interesting. They use their, usually use their sensuality to control men. They also use public humiliation and sex. They love to control men through threatened public humiliation and through their sensuality and their sexuality. But in their private lives, publicly they appear holy. Privately they are not. The Jezebel spirit is basically a witchcraft demon. They're very religious, they're very spiritual, and they're very much in rebellion. They want to control others, they want to be in authority, and they use deceit and chronic manipulation to do that. And in the book of Revelation, something very interesting was illustrated to us. Jesus ran into this powerful demon a woman named Jezebel in the New Testament church. It's in Revelation chapter 2. Do you remember that? Jesus said, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, teaching them and seducing them. Now, you see, it's a female who's in authority, who likes control, and who is a seducer, a manipulator. That's the Greek word planeo, and it means, it's a Greek verb, it means to deceive someone. And it says, Jesus says, she, she teaches and seduces them to commit fornication. That's the Greek word pornuo, it was a Greek verb, and it means to engage in some type of sexual immorality, and in this particular context, it was related to religion and idolatry. And Jesus said, this woman who is teaching, who's in control, who's seducing people, and are uh, teaching them to commit fornication and teaching them to commit religious idolatry. Jesus said, I gave her space to repent. He gave her a chance to repent. What a great illustration of the Son of God. Even this type of a person infected with this type of a superpower demon, he still prefers mercy and still prefers grace to help in time of need. What an incredible Savior and what an amazing Lord you are serving today. If you get involved with someone who has a Jezebel spirit, uh, you are going to at some point in time have thoughts of, my God, I've got to get out of here. And some people will actually pack up and run from women who have these powerful demons. These Jezebel demons always have relationship problems. They always have deep-seated self, uh, self-centered insecurity, poor self-concepts. And these spirits are extremely difficult to get out, uh, will not change and will not repent and will not place themselves emotionally in a position to get healed. They have to be crushed. And so when you turn somebody over to the Lord who has a Jezebel spirit, they won't repent and cannot be delivered from this powerful demon until they are broken. So what usually happens is some kind of terrible negativity comes into the person's life an accident, an illness, a death in the family, something that really shakes them to the core, and then they will repent. If you have a Jezebel spirit and you want to be delivered and you're ready to repent and you've been broken, 602-636-5800. God wants to heal you and deliver you and give you the full power of the Holy Spirit and a true, broken, loving, humble heart. Now, there are a number of converted witches going around the United States warning that Satanists and practicing witches are infiltrating the church, especially the charismatic churches. And there have been a few books written about the subject, and some of you may have read them, and they suggest there's a diabolical plot to move into the churches posing as super spiritual Christians. And they've come to deceive and shipwreck the pastor, seduce the pastor, and also bring multitudes into occult worship and Satanism. Uh, These converted witches claim that the evil witches are already firmly established in numerous churches and that they're already in control of certain pastors and they're controlling congregations 
and they're causing death and divorce and wickedness and great confusion. We get a number of letters, in fact, in our office, and often it's hard for me to tell whether some of them are just mad at the preacher and suggesting he's full of the devil. Uh, I don't know, but some of them are very legitimate. Now, I thank God for all the witches that are being saved, because I believe the Holy Ghost has power to go to any witch's coven. He can go anywhere into the dregs of hell and send Holy Ghost conviction and save the very dregs of humanity. Hallelujah. I believe that with all my heart. And I thank God that those who worship is Satan are turning to the Lord, many of them. But we, listen to me please, we dare not allow the devil's power to be magnified in the house of God. We dare not give him more power than God has permitted him, and he is limited in his power. Remember the disciples that came back after the Lord said, go out and heal the sick and raise the dead? They said, even the devils are subject unto us. Now, the only pastor or pastors that can fall under the control of a witch is one who is indulging in secret sin. If a pastor is living in secret sin, uh, and he's driven by greed, or he's driven by a need of success, he's betrayed the Lord with a spirit of unbelief, he's neglected his word, he's neglected the study, he's neglected the house of God in prayer, he has opened his heart, and he is capable of being seduced or controlled by other spirits. But a man who walks in the Holy Ghost, and he's mortified the deeds of his flesh, and he has the sword of the Lord in his hands, he will know the enemy, he will discern the trap, and he will take the sword of the Lord, and he will defeat the enemy, and he will not be seduced. A slave girl, in fact, they'll do what Paul the Apostle did, and Paul the Apostle was a true shepherd. And Paul the Apostle in Philippi had a slave girl possessed by the devil. She was a practicing witch with a spirit of divination, and she sought to infiltrate Paul's ministry. And Paul knew that she was not truly converted. And she would go everywhere Paul went and crying out after him, These are the servants of the Most High God. They show the way of salvation. In other words, she tried to infiltrate Paul's ministry. Paul's spirit was disturbed. He knew there was something wrong. He deserved it, discerned there was a trap in it. And he turned and spoke to the evil spirit in that witch. And he said, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Paul was unmoved by these evil spirits. Unmoved by witches. Unmoved. We've got Christians who are scared to death of the Haitians moving in here in New York City and putting curses on them. I, we've had numbers uh, at this altar under terrible bondage and terrible fear. And then when we hear that there are so-called witches moving into the church that are going to control, listen, there is no congregation on the face of this earth who can fall into deception if they are controlled by the Holy Spirit, they're open the Word of God, they're living in holiness, and they're covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, that congregation will not come under deception. They're covered by shepherds who are walking in the Spirit of God. There are ministers of the gospel who do fall into deep sin. They fall into evil degradation. But I want you to know they've not been leaped upon by the devil. Now, the devil did leap on the seven sons of Sceva. And these ministers' sons, who were not living for Jesus, saw them casting out devils, and he tried to exercise the devil out of a man. And those demons inside that man said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know, but who are you? And they leaped on that, those seven sons and tore their clothes off, and they were running in panic. Panic. Why? Because they didn't know Jesus. They were walking in the Spirit. They were not mortifying the deeds of the flesh. And there are some ministers who have given place to the devil, but the reason they did, they went out flirting in the devil's territory. They got off of God's ground and moved into the devil's territory. And when you do that, you open up yourself to demon powers. Now, a congregation that's bathed in the presence of Jesus does not have to scream commands of the devil. You don't have to scream at the devil. We've never screamed at him here. I've heard people screaming at the devil as if, you know, as if God were deaf and the devil was deaf and the people were deaf. You don't have to scream. In fact, I'll tell you what. You know the greatest uh, uh, wall of fire against the devil and demon powers is the very presence of Jesus? 
When Jesus comes, the demons of hell and the powers of Satan cannot coexist with the actual presence of Jesus. So that's why it's important to go to church where you know Jesus manifests himself. Hallelujah. Boy, there have been times, uh, there, there was one uh, witch that came in, it was near the sound table back here. And one of our ladies in the choir stood looking at her when she was in all these incantations and going through these signs. And I'll tell you what, when the presence of Jesus comes, they begin to back away. You can see him shut right up. They cannot coexist with the presence, the actual presence of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, you ask me, Brother Dave, are there churches today that are controlled by witches and evil spirits and demonic powers? Absolutely, yes. Now, I think of one large Pentecostal church in America. It had over 2,000 members. And the pastor had a, a lustful, evil spirit. He committed one act of adultery after another. His wife got involved. And he introduced a whole new doctrine he called spiritual connections. And this spiritual connection, he, he had tape after tape, a whole doctrine he developed where he said, you come in, they introduce ballroom dancing right in the church. The music is very demonic and sensuous. And he said, that's the Spirit of God. And when you look around, uh, he said, we're going to dance. They started dancing. Men, with men, men and women dancing right in the church, arm in arm. And he said, look in the eye, and when you make a connection, that's God. And so they were committing adultery. Uh, de uh, the, the deacons, the elders, the pastor and the wife, wife swapping. Uh, then they had a room, six different rooms, where you, you elevated until finally you got up in the one room where nobody knows what went on in that room. That pastor said, I got involved in that on a network up there. They called, asked, I said, it's the devil himself. And it was in the newspapers. That preacher's son, that Pentecostal preacher's son committed suicide. The daughter, his daughter divorced and ran off with another man. The wife was almost in a nervous breakdown. A young mother so distraught that her husband went off with another woman, drowned her baby in the bathtub. The whole church's wife was suicide and divorce. And now that church is in one lawsuit after another because of marriages and homes broken up. You see, that was a man who had a spirit of lust. And that one shepherd, that one man full of Satan, opened up his whole congregation to demonic powers. Folks, whether you go to this church or not, be careful where you go. Be careful that you have a spirit of discernment. Because you can sit under a shepherd that has been opened to the devil, and he can open up your heart if you don't know the Lord. If you're not walking in righteousness, they can open up your heart to these things. Now, my message tonight has to do with another kind of witchcraft, which is far more subtle and dangerous than the occult. And it's not brought into the church by witches, but it's brought by a multitude of Christians who don't even know that they're under the spell of this particular witchcraft. Now, the kind of witchcraft I'm going to talk about tonight, and this is not a, a trick, this is not a joke, I'm not trying to sensationalize it. This is God's own definition of witchcraft, and I'm going to show it to you in just a moment. But this witchcraft is in Times Square Church. It's in every church in America. It's in every church on the face of the earth. In some form or another, it may be just a seed, but it's there. Now listen to me, please. How can the devil possibly deceive God's elect? How could the devil come? Is he going to come into a church that has spiritual discernment and bring witches? No, because that is too obvious. We would discern that. We would see it. We would deal with it. What is he going to do? Is he going to bring in some kind of occult seduction? No, you see, when you walk in the Spirit and have discernment, you become aware of the devices of the devil. But there's one device, there's one subtle device so subtle that we missed it. Many people miss it. And it opens you up to all kinds of demonic activity. And I want to deal with it tonight. It's so subtle that very few in this house tonight that have the seed of this witchcraft in them could even know it until it's exposed. Now, I'm asking the Holy Ghost tonight through the power of His Word to expose it, pull the covers off. When I saw it, it shook my soul. I want you to see it first 10, First Samuel, 15th chapter. First Samuel, 15th chapter. You'll see that I'm not trying to stretch this. You'll see it just as it's written. 1 Samuel 15. I'll wait till I hear the rustling of the leaves stop. Are you in 15? 
1 Samuel 15, go to verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of what? I read it again. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Therefore, I reject this king. It goes on. All right, look this way, please. Here is a, here's described a witchcraft far more dangerous than the occult he's kind of been talking about. And it's controlling pastors. It's controlling entire congregations and some in this church tonight. It's a rebellion against the word of God. He said, you've not obeyed the word. And he said, that disobedience causes rebellion. And that rebellion is his witchcraft. And that's God's own definition. That's not my definition. God put that definition on it. Now, before you relax and sit back and say, Oh, well, thank God. That's not me. I don't have rebellious spirit against God's Word. I love the Word. I'm walking in obedience. Let me tell you, that's what I thought. And I believe I am. But God began to show me the sea deep inside and where it could lead to. You may have in your heart now the the seed, the beginning influence of this evil charm that leads finally to this open witchcraft. Jesus gave us a parable that totally exposes this kind of witchcraft. Now, I want you to go to Matthew 21 and see it. Matthew 21. And all week long, all week I've been in this one parable, and the Lord said, in fact, I got the directive from God. I was praying to the Holy Spirit, whispered, David, and this was Monday, I believe, I want you to preach Sunday night from Matthew 21 and Mark 12, the same story. And I read it and read it and prayed over it. And I couldn't see it until uh, Friday night when God showed me that it's a story, a parable about witchcraft, spiritual witchcraft, this disobedience, this rebellion. And I'd never seen it before. And all the years I've studied this one parable. All right, Matthew 21, verse 33, beginning to read. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about. And he digged a wine press in it and built a tower. And he let it out to husbandmen and went to a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? And they said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits of their seasons. Now look at me, please. Usually, we don't go any further than this. We, we interpret it like this. Well, Jesus is talking strictly to Pharisees because you'll, you'll find uh, further down, verse 45, and when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spake to them. And, and in this, it, uh, it, it is saying that God sent to the Jew prophet after prophet Watchman after watchman, they rejected all of this. And now, finally, Jesus is coming. He's speaking to the Pharisees. They're going, he said, you're going to kill me. You're going to crucify me. That this is strict to the Jews. They're the husbandmen that have crucified the Lord. And then God's going to give it to the Gentiles. Another group of husbandmen who will do as the Lord pleases. That is yes. That's part of it. But I'll tell you what. When Jesus speaks, he speaks to his church. He speaks to his body. And I saw something, and it's just burning in my heart, and I want the Holy Spirit to bring it out. He's speaking something much deeper than that. It's more than a parable about Christ's battle with Pharisees. There are two powers at work here. It's the power of Jesus Christ looking for submission and obedience, because that's what the fruit is. The fruit of righteousness is obedience. And Jesus, looked, or God looking for obedience, sent His servants 
prophets, uh, teachers, watchmen, warning, saying, where is the fruit? Trying to produce obedience in us. There's another power here. If this, is a, this is a supernatural battle between two great supernatural, divi- uh, supernatural powers. The power of Jesus Christ and the power of Satan. And they're after one thing. They're after the inheritance. And who is the inheritance? You and I are Christ's inheritance. All things were created by Him, for Him. We are His inheritance. We belong to Jesus. And all through this, you're seeing a great battle that you and I are engaged in right now. And whether you know it or not, you're going to fall in one category. You're going to be under the submission and obedience of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Christ, or you're sitting here tonight under the influence of this other satanic power trying to get you, to break you away. They said, there's the hair. Let's go after the inheritance. It will be ours. That's Satan talking. That's the devil himself talking. And that's exactly what is happening in the church of Jesus Christ while I speak to you right now. The key to understanding this parable is this very phrase. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize his inheritance. In other words, I'm, the devil says, I'm going to take that seed that's inside them. In fact, we were born with this seed, the Adam nature. That seed that has a propensity toward evil and rebellion. And this is what broke out in the garden. This was rebellion. And the devil says, we're going to cause that to grow because they've given us a place. And I'm going to cause that to be open rebellion. And then finally they will end up crucifying him and we will be in control. This is Satan speaking. I will be in control of this vessel, this body. This inheritance will be mine. Now, follow me closely, please. I believe with all my heart that he's speaking to us and I can prove it to you. I'm reading from Hebrews, the sixth chapter, of a people. Don't turn there, just listen. A people, listen, who've tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come. How many in this church have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come? That's the Holy Ghost. How many have tasted that? All right. Who is it? The Bible says that this people who had tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come, they, they crucify him to themselves, the Son of God afresh, and they put him to an open shame. He's not talking about homosexuals or witches. He's talking about those who tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and they put him to an open shame. Now think of it for just a minute. It is those who have heard and tasted the true word of God. They've allowed a spirit of rebellion to take root. And Satan moved in. And in the end, they wind up possessed, totally possessed of the devil. So much that they'll crucify Christ and put him in open shame, even though they tasted his good word and of eternal things. It's frightening. And listen to this, that same passage. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, if they should fall to renew them again to repentance. If those who tasted the Holy Ghost, tasted the Word of God, were walking with Jesus, fall, it's impossible to renew them. What does that mean? Well, folks, it, it's, I see it in the light of this. Repentance is of no effect whatsoever where there's rebellion. If there is rebellion, if there's rebellion, it's impossible to renew you again to the Holy Spirit. If rebellion against the Lord, if this witchcraft is in you, God says, I can't hear you, and I'm going to prove that tonight. He doesn't hear your prayers. Until you see that rebellion and deal with it in the power of Jesus Christ and the power of His Word, it's impossible to renew you, the Scripture says. Now, let me get right into this uh, matter of the witchcraft God's talking about. First of all, The witchcraft of rebellion begins with a little root of bitterness. A little root of bitterness. Now I'm going to ask God to come down on this and dig it out. I want to talk to you tonight about being poisoned with the gall of bitterness. Poisoned with the gall of bitterness. Now Paul introduced this phrase, gall of bitterness. He was speaking about Simon. 
Simon had been into the occult. Simon had been very affected. He had masses around him and he was using false magic and he was a phony. But he did have a heart for people. He wouldn't be doing what he was trying to do, what he tried to offer later. But you see, he, he saw Paul and the apostles casting out devils and they laid hands on people and they began to speak with tongues and were filled with the Holy Ghost. And he offered money to buy that power so he could do it. I, I, in fact, I want you to turn with me, if, if you will, please, to uh, Acts the 8th chapter. Acts the 8th chapter. It's better to see it in black and white. The 8th chapter of Acts. I'll tell you what, God's conviction is going to come down here in just a few minutes on all of us. Acts 8, 17. Speaking of Paul and the apostles, then, Acts 8, 17, then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered the money, saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if per perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall, this is King James, the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Look at me, please. Gall is green. It's gangrene. It's poison. And it means envy. It stands... You know what? You ever heard the expression, green with jealousy? Green with envy? That's gall. And what Paul the Apostle is saying to Simon, Simon, look at him. He's a young convert. He claims to be a convert. In fact, the Scripture says, and it's in verse 13, Simon himself believed also. Look at it. Verse 13. Simon himself believed also and was baptized. He continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. He, he, he never missed church. He followed Philip. He followed Paul around. Everywhere they went, he was watching. You know what he was saying? I can do that. I'm a gifted man. And there was an envy that came in to his heart. And follow me, please, because I'm going someplace with this, with the help of God. Here's a saved young convert baptized with the Holy Ghost, baptized in water at least, baptized. And at every place he looks, he sees this happening. But Simon has a dangerous mixture in his heart. A dangerous mixture in his heart that is destructive. And it's this. Listen to it. A desire to be used of God mixed with a desire for preeminence. A desire to be used of God, but a desire to be in the forefront, to be recognized, to be first and not second or last. And what a dangerous mixture this is. He truly wanted God to use him. But he also had this need to be recognized. In fact, the Bible says he himself considered himself some great one. He had ability, was self-assured. He said to himself, I can do that. I feel for people. I've got compassion. And really, just wanted to receive the Holy Ghost. And, and there are many converts say like that. Well, why can't I be used of God? I, I have the ability. I have all these things. I, what's wrong with me? Simon wanted the power and the place without paying the right price. He tried to buy it with a shortcut. And so it is in the work of God today and in the church of Jesus Christ. So many people trying to take shortcuts to power and usefulness in place. And these shortcuts have to do with talent and ability. I have the talent. Listen, you can have the talent, but if you don't have a servant's heart, God can't use you. If you don't have a servant's heart, you can't be used. You've got a dangerous mixture in you. And there's nothing more sad in my eyes and my heart than to see talent that is not submitted by humility. Anyone with talent that's not humble is dangerous. To himself primarily and to the work of God. I, I, I've been pleading with God all afternoon to help me preach this with love. I want, I want the love of Jesus to come through on this. 
because God's trying to save some people here tonight, trying to save us from something that's very, very dangerous. In, in 3 John, the third verse, we read this, don't turn. We read of a man in the church named Diotrephes. And Diotrephes loved to have the preeminence among the brethren. He loved to have the spotlight. He loved to be noticed. And when things didn't go his way, the Bible, according to uh, John's gospel, or, or John, third chapter of John, 3 John, it says, the Diotrephes began to prat. He was pratting with malicious words. Now, a pratter is one who babbles about trifles. Babbles. It just pours out. Now, I want you to... You, you know that uh, I, I see this uh, man Simon, first of all. Paul says, no. He said, you have no place. You have no lock in the work of God. Because your heart's not right with God. And I can see Simon going away. He, he's beaten down because he's been rebuked in front of the whole crowd. He's been rebuked. A man of God pointed his finger at him and said, no, you're in the gall of bitterness. You've got a root of bitterness in you. There's something down inside, very, very deep in you. And so what happens if you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, if you don't see what the devil's trying to do to you, you'll begin to hurt, you become wounded, and then you begin to pat. And that's to just uh, build this trifle into something so major that it eats up your spiritual life. He became offended at John's actions and message, and he became irritable, and he began to engage in gossip. His vanity was pricked, his pride was wounded, and he went about telling a story of being wounded by other people in the house of God, and he disturbed the peace of the brethren. And more than that, he began to win many people to his arguments because he sounded so right. He was so hurt. But you see, he had the sin of impatience. He couldn't wait until God would do the work in his heart. Listen to me. I want to make a statement. And this comes right to the heart of what God's trying to say to us tonight. A wounded spirit is fertile ground for a root of bitterness. A wounded spirit is fertile ground for a root of bitterness. Proverbs 18, 14. A wounded spirit, who can bear it? Who can stand a wounded spirit? Follow me. Isaiah, looking at backslidden Israel. He's looking at it. He said, these people, it's, it's become a cage of unclean birds. Wickedness on all sides. How did it happen to God's people? How did they become so possessed by demonic powers? How could a chosen people become so depressed so he, in fact he said they're, they're, they're like an isolated booth in a vineyard he said they're, they're like this study all alone like God doesn't care he said what's happened to these people what's, and he begins to explain it he said from the sole of the foot even to the head there's no soundness but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores they have not been closed Neither have the wounds been bound or softened with ointment. Then he went on to warn the people of God. Those who wouldn't have their wounds healed. Those who went about with their sores bleeding, bruised. He's saying, as long as you won't go for healing. As long as you go around bleeding with your wounds. In fact, he said, there's blood on your hands. I'll read it to you. Spread forth your hands. He's speaking to those who go about wounded with sores, no soundness in their flesh, putrefying sores. He said, when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear you, for there is blood on your hands. Whose blood? Your own. You've been wounded and you're bleeding. You've gone around bleeding on others. You've got a putrefying sore. Somebody in the house, you got wounded you. Somebody in your family, somebody in the job, you've been wounded, you've got a root of bitterness. And you go about with this sword and it's bleeding. Your source oozing blood and corruption. And you won't come to the master for healing. You won't run to him, you don't realize the devil's trying to get you into this witchcraft of rebellion. 
You see, the husbandman of this vineyard in the parable I read to you, somewhere they allowed... Now, this is the Lord who... This is His vineyard, remember. This is the Lord's vineyard He's talking about. And the Lord gave them commandments. He said, I'm, I'm expecting a harvest. I expect fruit. And that fruit is righteousness leading to obedience. And somewhere along the line before the harvest came and the Lord called them up for account, somewhere a root of bitterness sprang up. I don't know what it is, but it had to do with authority. It had to do with submission. They were not going to do all this work. They're not going to put forth all this effort without a little more piece of the action. All this rebellion began to build up. And you see the hand of the devil behind all of this. Folks, this parable is profound yet simple. It's beyond the Pharisees, beyond everything else. It's a battle for our souls and our minds. Here, let me show you how dangerous rebellion is and why God calls it witchcraft. Look at this. Go back to Matthew 21, if you will, please. Go back to Matthew 21. Verse 34. And when the time, when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him and seize the inheritance. Look at me, please. Now, these husbandmen represent children of God engaged in religious work. They're engaged in religious activity. Now, I ask you a question. This hit me today. How could, how could Pharisees, who are supposed to be so upright... Now, these Pharisees were known to be super... Uh, 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 cautious about the law. In fact, they were so cautious and so uh, bound by the law that they uh, counted every mint leaf and tithed every mint leaf that they, if they had a garden and they had uh, 10 mint leaves and each mint leaf, uh, leaf plant had 50 uh, leaves on it, they would pick the leaves and count and give God his 10%. They loved their children. There's much evidence that these men loved their children. They loved their wives. They were family men. They spent their Sabbaths in the synagogue, pouring over the law, reading Isaiah, talking about the coming of Messiah. These, these men would go all over the world to reach one convert, the Scripture says, to make him a disciple of the law. Then how in the world did they become so vicious that they would stone and kill and murder and crucify? What happened? How does that happen to a religious bunch who have a law that they cling to. It says, thou shalt not kill. And yet they've got murder in their hearts. Where did it come from? That's not human. That's not human at all. To come out, take a man out of the city and stone him to death and kill the messengers of God. That is superhuman. That is not of the flesh. That is out of this world. That is demonic. Where did it come from? They knew what the Master demanded of them. But there was a rage. A rage. Oh, if you hold that root of bitterness, nothing short of rage is going to follow. There will come a rage in your heart. There will come a rage in your heart that you'll be able to sit in any Holy Ghost meeting and hear the holy men of God filled with the Holy Ghost holding the sword of the Lord loving you. And it'll come on deaf ears and you'll rage. And you'll stone the prophets. You'll crucify Christ and put him in open shame because there's a rebellion that's come as a result of a root of bitterness that was never dealt with. And then you'll gather with others of like wounds and you'll have gall gatherings. Where all you do is share your gall. Gangrene spills all over the room. The truth is, bitterness blinds. Now listen to this statement 
I'm going to make it twice. You lose your spiritual vision in proportion to the growth of your bitterness. In other words, the more your bitterness grows, the blinder you become. So the word of God, the word of the prophets is watch many shepherds. Let a root of bitterness keep festering and let the wound turn to gangrene and let the sore spread poison all through your soul and you will end up just like these violent Pharisees. I've seen that rage in Christians. I've seen it. I saw it once in this church when two sisters were fighting over a seat. That's my chair. I said... Sister, what's going on? That's not the Spirit of Christ. You know why that rage is there? There's a root of bitterness somewhere. It's not been dealt with. Christ cannot bring out of his, vir- out his virtues in you. He can't bring out His graces in you. He will not try to fight through that rage in you. You've got to deal with the wound. You've got to have the oil of the Holy Ghost applied to that wound, breathed on, healed, bandaged. And that's what He's trying to do tonight. You end up pratting, throwing stones at God's servants and God's people. You will open up every door and window of your heart and soul to demon possession. You'll end up a mouthpiece of the devil. Your tongue will become a spear that pierces the side of Christ. You will turn off all preaching and prophets. I'm going to tell you something. The work of God will go on. It always does. And God will replace you. But I'm telling you tonight, the invitation of the Holy Ghost is to deal with it in this church. I'm not trying to get you established in this church. I'm trying to get you established in Jesus. And whether you go to this church or not, if you don't deal with that root of bitterness, if you don't get that wound and that hurt healed, You'll run from church to church. You'll get in one mess after another and it'll get worse. You'll finally become demon-possessed and you'll put that spear right through the heart of Jesus again, right through the side of Jesus. You'll put Jesus to an open shame everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. Has someone wounded you? Is there a root of bitterness in you? I beg you tonight. The Scripture says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking, be put away from you with all the malice. Put it away, because it's of the devil, it'll destroy you. Secondly, the witchcraft of rebellion ends in a lack of reverence for Jesus. Oh, listen to this, verse 37. But last of all, he sent his son unto them, saying... They will reverence my son. Now, I know the primary application is the Pharisees in this religious Sanhedrin that he was addressing. They had shut their ears to the prophets and the watchmen. In fact, Jesus said, Behold, I'll send unto you prophets, and some of them ye shall kill. You'll crucify them, some you'll scourge in your synagogues, and you'll persecute the prophets from city to city. Beloved, listen to me close. I've got to get this into your heart. Jesus is speaking of a very profound thing here. He's trying to expose the work of the devil, what he's trying to do. Jesus said to them, the Pharisees, Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you can't hear my word. Because you're your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. I speak the truth to you, but you believe me not. Look at me, please. How? How will you sit through this message tonight? And I know I have the Spirit of the living God upon me. You've never seen or heard this senior pastor under more anointing than God has on me right now. You're hearing the living Word of God. And how do you sit there and not hear it and say, that's not me? How do you sit there with the wound? That wound may have gone way back somewhere. You may not even be able to look someone in this church in the eye. I don't know. Someone's bypassed you. Someone's been promoted over you on the job. Or it could be in this church. It could be in the music program. It could be in the ushers. It could be anywhere. And here you sit. And the Lord's trying to embrace you in love, saying, Don't you understand? You're being caught as a pawn of the devil. He's trying to possess you. 
He's going after the inheritance. He's trying to seize upon the Lord's inheritance. You're the Lord's inheritance. He doesn't want you to be a Simon. He wants to get that gall of bitterness out of you. Don't end up like these Pharisees. He said, why don't you understand? And that's, that's what I think so many times. I, I'll preach my heart out and I know that there's some people that need to break and say, Oh, Brother Dave, that's me. That's why things are so wrong in my marriage and my home. That's why things are going wrong. There's something wrong. Yes, there's a root. There's a wound. There's a putrefying sore. He said, you don't understand me. You don't hear me. Because you're the father of the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. I'll tell you the truth, but you won't believe me. And I'm telling you the truth. I'm looking you in the eye. Because I have to stand before God and answer. One day, if this root of bitterness destroys you and drives you back to where you were, you begin to live for the devil. And that bitterness eats you up. And that wound crosses you to the ground. When all the while you knew that Jesus stood there with his open eyes, you knew there was a way out. You knew that you could be healed. And I'm telling you, there is healing. There is gracious healing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know what Jesus said? He asked the Pharisees, what, what will the master do when he comes and makes these men give an account? You know what the Pharisees, they pronounce judgment on themselves. He said, why? The husbandman will miserably crush those men and destroy them. And all the while they knew he was talking about them. See, that's where you finally come to where you don't even fear judgment. You don't fear hell. You don't fear anything. Because you're blind and you have been left senseless. No more sensitivity to people, to God, to the Holy Ghost, to the preaching. Because a stubbornness has set in. The Bible makes it clear in that very verse that he gave, Samuel gave uh, concerning Saul. Saul got so hard, he wound up visiting the witch of Endor. He said, God doesn't speak to me. Nobody speaks to me anymore. I'm not hearing from God. So he goes to a witch. Brother, sister, that's where it ends. And I, I grieve that some of you in this church tonight may end in that if you don't hear. You see, the Bible says, and last of all, he sent his son. You know what that means? In the last day, to a last day people, when Jesus came to the earth, that was the beginning of the last days. He said, the last. Jesus is the last thing God has to offer humanity now. He said, the people, they've turned down my prophets. They've turned down my watchmen. God said, I'm going to give them one last chance, one last resort, one last hope. My son and brother and sister, we live in a day where it's Jesus or judgment. There's nothing else left. And if you will not accept the claims of Christ tonight for healing, if you'll not let him pluck that out by the roots, there's nothing left. The Lord said, I don't have anything left. You won't listen to the prophets. You won't listen to the pastor. You won't listen to the shepherds. And you won't take Jesus. You won't reverence him. Reverence for Jesus. He said, thou reverence my son. They didn't. Reverence for Jesus is not a feeling. It's not some mystical piety where you say, Jesus. It's not some holy, sounding, false piety. Reverence is something you do. It's obeying His Word. It's obedience to His Word. Hearing it in the Spirit and say, yes, God, that's me. I hear it, that's me. If you go out of here tonight clinging to your wound holding to your grudge, justifying your bitterness, you not only do not reverence Jesus, but you're putting Him to an open shame and you're crucifying Him all over again. I want you to go to the hope. I want you to go to uh, Psalms. Uh, there's hope. Psalms 107. You know I, har I, I don't preach a hard message unless I close with hope. Psalm 107. 107. Folks, before we go any further, just hold the Bible open there and look at me before I close. Is there 
root bitterness, a wound, a sore? Is there rebellion beginning to rise up in your heart? Have you talked to others about your hurt and your wound? Oh, you'll find a sympathetic ear. But you won't get God's ear. He said, you can pray all you want. I won't hear you. You can raise your hands. I won't hear you. You can praise and worship. I won't hear you. Because you've got a bleeding sore. You've got blood on your hands. You're not going to lift bloody hands to me when I've promised you deliverance. But I tell you this. I said, God, if you're going to have me preach that, you've got to find the hope for me. I've got to leave this people with hope. And I have to have that hope. Because that seed of rebellion is in me. It's in all of us. And it has to be plucked out. It has to be dealt with. We have to see it. There's not one on this stage that doesn't have the potential of that rising up. And it has to be cut down by the Word of God and the Spirit. Look at verse 9, beginning to read. Psalm 107, verse 9. And when you read this with me, if you've had a root of bitterness or wounded, any rebellion at all, let this bring hope to you. For He satisfieth the longing soul, and He filleth the hungry soul with goodness, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore He brought them down, that brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of all their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and break the bands in sunder. All the men would praise the Lord for His goodness, for His wonderful works. To the children of men, He's broken the gates of brass and cut the bars in sunder. Hallelujah. Those who were in rebellion, they cried out to God and God heard them and delivered them. Stand, please. Now, please, no one help the Holy Ghost. Let's just quietly in His presence. He's going to deal with the Holy Spirit. By your heads, please. By your heads. Spirit, Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, I'm asking you now, Holy Spirit, to confirm your word in the hearts of this people up in the balcony here in the main floor. Oh, God, I plead for this people. I plead for us. Lord, we as workers, shepherds, and leaders, those who sit in the congregation, none of us are better than the other. Lord, we all fight the same battles. But you have brought a word to us tonight that we have to deal with. God, by your Spirit, open up hearts to you tonight. Heal the brokenhearted. Heal the wounds. Heal the sores. Heal the hurt. So that those who have been wounded and hurt can come forth into greater victory than they've ever known. They can again be embraced by the whole body of Jesus. And again, they can fall down and raise their hands and the heavens begin to open again. Bring that open heaven, Lord Jesus. I don't believe there's anybody here who wants to have a closed heaven. They want to be heard on high. Lord, I believe these people love you. We love you with all of our hearts. Now, Jesus, pluck out any root of bitterness. If, if there's one person we could think of now that we're bitter toward, or if anyone that's wounded or with a sore that's festering, I ask you, Lord, in this service tonight, in this next few moments, to bring healing, absolute healing, in Jesus' name. Now, all over this house, while we're in His presence, uh, choir begins to sing. You, you, you say, Brother David, the Word shook my soul. Uh, you can look at me right now. I'll tell you, if I look you right in the eye, I feel the holy thunder of God in my heart. God is saying, if you don't deal with that, you're going to wind up in open rebellion and be totally demon-possessed. And it, you can't begin. You think in the world you had problems. You don't know what it is. You don't know the terror of that. Having tasted of the good things of God and said it's impossible to renew you because you stay in that state of rebellion. If you've been dealt with, I've tried in love. Now, I, I know I get loud, but it's only because I feel it so strong. But I'm not shouting at you. God's called us to love you. And maybe you're here for the first time, I don't know. But I know, as sure as I stand here, God spoke. And He's speaking to us now. If you've got that root in you, 
don't, don't stand here another five minutes. You get down here, and when you walk down the aisle, you say, Jesus, this is it. I don't want this wound to go festering anymore. I want to be healed. Now, you're going to have to take a step. You may have to go to somebody. You may have to embrace somebody. You have to say, I'm sorry. You have to repent to somebody beside God. But I'll tell you, when you do, they say that when uh, uh, steel breaks and they solder it together, it's stronger at that solder than it is any other place. And the Lord starts soldering and healing. You have more strength there than you've ever known. Then you let Jesus bring forth the healing. Oh, I, I don't want to see anybody walk out heartbroken or wounded. Jesus wants to heal you. And I, I believe this all my heart. He wants to heal. There's going to be a great healing here tonight. If that's you, if God spoke. Now, uh, if you've been coming, see, we have some, now listen close. I say it in love. We have some people come for every invitation. If, if you've been coming, almost every invitation, I want you to stay back for a while unless you're, you're deeply wounded or something. For those, so you're not just filling it up and we don't have room for those because this whole place is going to be filled tonight. But if you have been dealt with by the Holy Spirit, I want you to come right now while the choir is singing. We're going to ask God for a miracle for you tonight. We're going to ask God for healing right now. Hallelujah. Sing together. Up in the balcony, come down the stairs. Now, lest the, lest the enemy try to tell you, or anyone here, and I preach directly at you, look down here. But all these that stand here, who received the Word of God and felt it was directed by the Holy Spirit to each one, every heart. Now, you that are standing here right now, I'm going to ask God. I don't know how the Holy Ghost does it. You don't have to scream at Him. You don't have to beg Him or plead with Him. He said, I'm more willing to give than you are to receive. He wants to give you healing. But you have to be willing to take a step of faith right now. I want you to think of that person, individual, or the hurt. I want you to look at it right now and say, Jesus, by your grace, I lay that down here. I'm not going to go back to my seat carrying this burden anymore. I want it out. And many of you standing here are going to have to make a call or go to somebody. And you go, or else you're just going to have to say, Holy Spirit, right now, remove this from me. I don't want this thing to take root anymore. I want it plucked out by the roots. Hallelujah. How many of you that are standing here need God to heal you right now? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high. You want a healing from the Lord. Keep your hand raised. Keep it up. Our church, will you pray with me? Will you believe God for... And some of you in the audience, you may need right now... You didn't come forward. You need the same healing. 
Father, I pray that you will bring that healing to those that stand in front of this church tonight. Many dozens up here who need to be delivered from the bondage of a root of bitterness, a spirit of rebellion. Oh, Jesus, come now by your Holy Spirit. Reach into every heart. Pluck it out by the roots. Cast it out, oh God, because here stands a people ready to be healed. The Lord God shall heal. He shall heal, sanctify, and deliver. I want you that are up here to pray this prayer with me and pray it from the depths of your heart. Oh, Jesus. Louder, please. Oh, Jesus. I need help. I need deliverance. Pluck it out. Heal my wound. Heal my heart. Forgive me. I don't want to carry it. I lay it down at your feet. Jesus, send the Holy Ghost. Fill my heart. Cleanse my mind. Give me a new heart and a new mind. And let the glory of Jesus fill my soul. Now just raise your hands and thank Jesus right now. Lord, I thank you for your healing power. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. Beloved, it doesn't take God all night. The moment you're ready, He's ready. Some of you that are standing right now, just let the Spirit breathe on you right now. Let's sing it again. Spirit of the Lord uh, that you were singing, just look up to Jesus right now and receive from the Lord. He's here to heal. He's here to change your heart, give you a new mind. God's able to take it all out and bring that healing. Whatever it may be, let him heal you right now. Just stand in his presence. Let's all sing it. Let the healing power of Jesus flow into our hearts. Mm -hmm. 